Before today's episode starts, an announcement for all of you. The first single I produced alongside Kei Cerise just went up on my second YouTube channel. It's a Japanese cover of All Time Lows, Fool's Holiday, sung by my character Jamie Furukawa. Check it out with a pinned comment down below and subscribe for more future song covers. Now, on to today's mega collection episode of Scary National Park, State Park, and Park Ranger Stories. Enjoy. Okay, so I'm here today to share something with all of you that happened when I was in a national park. The thing is, I don't know exactly what it was or what happened exactly, but I thought maybe one of you might know. Therefore, allow me to properly tell this story. This happened about 12 years ago, so it has been quite some time, but even so, I have pretty good memory, and I remember a lot of the details. After all, you have something like this happen to you, you're not exactly going to forget it. For some quick background context on myself, I was 22 years old at the time, and I was attending the University of Arizona. My life there was like any other average ordinary college student, studying, exams, projects, the usual. Well, one summer after finals were over, me and my girlfriend, who in this story we will call Laura, decided to go on a little trip. For this trip, we would go and visit her family that lives in Seattle and spend a couple of weeks there. Though our destination was Seattle, we would find ourselves in a national park hundreds of miles away. So on a bright and early Saturday morning, me and my girlfriend get everything into our car and we start our four day road trip to Seattle. The reason it was going to take us a few days was because we wanted to go and visit a national park in California. Since we were both in biology, we were always fascinated with learning more about the nature and trees, the different variety, the animals that roam around, all of it. Moving on, it took us about 8 hours of driving, but eventually we stopped in this town called Three Rivers. A lot of people usually will stop there before going into the national park. This is where we found ourselves spending the night until the following morning. On day number 2, our adventure into the national park was about to begin with something strange happening. Me and Laura ended up waking up early to the sound of helicopters, as well as police sirens making their way down the road from us. Just so you know, it was around 4 in the morning. Both of us found it weird, especially considering we were right next to the woods, but we tried not to think much about it. Regardless, we were now awake, even though our alarm wasn't supposed to go off until 6am. We figured that this was just a great way to catch the sunrise before the day got warm. So fast forward until later that evening. Me and Laura have finally set up a campsite and it's now around 8pm. Obviously the sun is already set. I remember we were just sitting there and talking and listening to the sounds of the crickets while looking back at our pictures we took. I don't know how long after that it was, but both of us suddenly started to hear branches breaking and footsteps. Both of us were sitting down, so obviously it was neither of us. Anyway, suddenly, this man came out of nowhere from behind some trees. I want to say he was probably in his late 40s, wearing older looking clothing that looked pretty dirty. He also had a backpack with him. At first he just stared at us and seemingly for longer than you would expect a normal person to do so. It's like he hasn't seen anyone in a very long time. After about 20 seconds of awkward silence, he finally spoke up and he said, Look, I need you all to do a quick favor for me. Do you have any food you could possibly share? I would really appreciate it. Right away, me and Laura had this really bad feeling about the entire situation, but as to not escalate things, we offered him some food. He now sat down on the other side of the campfire and ate some of the sandwich we gave him. While that was happening, all I was trying to do was act calm. After all, it could have just been that he was just another camper out here. Maybe he was just a little bit shy, but he seemed pretty nice. Because of this, I just decided to talk to him a little bit. So, what brings you out here? You must be like me and my girlfriend and enjoy the national park. This is actually our first time here. That was when he said, Look, I'm not here to talk to you. All you need to know is that I'm out here for reasons you don't need to know about. Now, why don't you just keep to yourself and let me finish this food? Attitude much? I mean, we did offer him some food, didn't we? Anyway, I let him finish the food, and then he gets up to leave. That's not before he turned around one last time, and he said, That was a really good sandwich. I think because of that, I'll let you two live. 
the two of you aren't worth my time. And that was that. He ends up leaving and heading off into the wilderness. You can imagine how confused we were right now. After all, being out there pretty much in the middle of nowhere and encountering the stranger definitely made us that much more alert and frightened. One thing was for sure, it did make it difficult to sleep that night and we almost considered leaving right there and then. Instead, we just decided to brave out the night and wait until morning to leave. Well, anyway, at around 3 in the morning, so about 5 hours after the encounter, my girlfriend and I are awoken to the sounds of footsteps once again. And unlike in the other stories where they circle around us, these ones just walk into the distance until eventually we no longer hear them. Strange, we thought, but perhaps another group of campers might be out here. We ignore it. Suddenly out of nowhere, we once again hear a familiar sound. Remember the helicopter from earlier in the morning that day? We can once again start hearing them approaching, with again the sounds of police sirens accompanying them. See, I forgot to mention, but we camped pretty close to a road that park rangers could use to get around the park. Both of us now open the tent to reveal a series of vehicles as they race down the road heading further into the park. A few of them ended up stopping down the road and some of the police officers stepped out of their cars. This was when I get out of the tent and I walk over to them and one of them sees me and says, Look son, you need to leave right now. There's been an incident and we need everybody to leave the area. But with that said, if you do need a ride back to town, we would be more than happy to take you. Well, since I wasn't going to get an answer for anything, my girlfriend and I take the offer and we return back to the small town. Once we had returned, we are questioned on what we saw and if we saw anything suspicious. After that, they let us go and we proceed to spend the night in a small motel. The following morning, we awoke and I heard from some of the employees at the motel that they had found somebody that they had been looking for. Apparently, he was a known felon and he was on the run from the police for quite some time. Apparently, this wasn't the first time he had been spotted. Instantly, I thought of the other night and I remembered about what happened with that stranger. To be honest, it's pretty crazy to think that we would run into somebody like that. But regardless, we soon put it behind us, and we eventually arrived in Seattle. This story is a bit different because I wasn't on the clock when this occurred. Still, I figure you all like stories from park rangers like myself. So here we go. During the summer of 2018, I would promised my two kids I would take them on a camping trip as part of a father and son's bonding trip. It was a long time coming, especially considering my job saw me working 40 hours a week. It was quite often I had to work overtime too, but I was able to secure this weekend for the three of us. What should have been fun in the woods, teaching my kids about survival and nature, turned into a real life horror story when we got an unexpected visitor. Now I don't want to spend the next 5 minutes explaining all the details that led up to the encounter, so I'll just get straight to it. It's around 10.30 p.m. and my kids are inside their tents. Both of them were asleep and I was reading a Harry Potter book using my lantern as some light. While I was lost in the world of magic and plot points, I started to notice what sounded like footsteps. Since I was so focused, I wrote them off as just my imagination, but it got to the point where I could no longer deny the sounds. That's why I grabbed my pistol and start to scan our campsite, but I don't see anything. While well, thinking I'm getting too old for my own good, I used the opportunity to get up and go and pee behind some trees. Once I was done and start to make my way back to the tent, I see them. Someone in a hoodie trying to make their way into the tent. I immediately panicked thinking about my kids, which was why I raised my voice and acknowledged this unexpected visitor. What in the world are you doing out here at this hour? They turned around and I see it's a man. He's about six foot. 160 to 170 pounds. Pretty scrawny to be honest. Anyway, he explains that he was just looking for some food and he wasn't sure if anybody was there. Yeah, because finding a tent with a campfire still lit was going to indicate it's abandoned. Whatever, buddy. Well, I decided to give him a leftover can of chili thinking that that was going to be the last time I see him. But instead, he does a complete 180 as he reveals a knife. He then demands I hand over any valuables I had on my person. If only he knew the grave decision that he had just made. I tell him to back off as I reveal my pistol and he pulls off another 180. You know I was joking, right? Come on, you don't think I would ever consider harming your family, would you? 
I tell him to get to step in and he wastes no time booking it, dropping the can of chili I'd given him. As for the rest of the camping trip, we called it off early and head back home. To this day, I still don't know if he was really just trying to get some extra food or he was using that as a distraction to gain my trust, only to attempt robbing us. Next time, pal, consider those you try to steal from, because you're going to find we aren't all that naive. Before I start, I want to preface with the following statement. In no way, shape, or form do I gain anything from making this story up. This is based off of true events, and I experienced them firsthand with fellow park rangers, who are also willing to go on the record. More than anything, I'm writing this story in to hopefully hear from someone who might recognize this cult or have more information. If you do, I'll look at the comment section and I'll provide you with more details. Anyway, let me get started. Back in the early 2000s, I used to be a park ranger that patrolled and worked in state parks in southern Alaska. During my almost 30-year career, I witnessed so many heart-racing moments, including once where I had a close encounter with some bears who were this close to tearing me to shreds. But perhaps it's not so much what scares Mother Nature can provide me with, but more so, people and their ever-longing goals to chill you to the core. Well, wouldn't you know, the Alaskan wilderness isn't home to just animal encounters. I forget exactly what year it was, but it was definitely during the spring. So we're talking about mid-April, early May, when the temperatures were comfortable 50 degrees. Anyway, I was on patrol with another park ranger after sunset, and as we drove around checking in on the campers that were scattered around the woods, we came into contact with one group in particular who called us over. They were mentioning how earlier in the daytime they saw some strange individuals in all black clothing and black robes carrying torches and rifles. If these individuals, according to these backpackers, were some sort of hunters, it definitely sounded as if they were dressed for the part. But forget the hunting clothing. This area was off limits to hunting, which meant we could give them a huge fine, if not a trip to jail for violating park rules. So anyway, we thanked them for the information and then we get on our radios to advise other park rangers within the vicinity of this strange sighting. No one had seen them, which made it our mission to locate these people and figure out what exactly they might be up to. So fast forward about 30 minutes of searching and two park rangers have joined our search. We eventually come across a restricted part of the woods that has a fence surrounding it. What we noticed was part of the fence had been cut, just enough for someone, or better yet, some ones, to make their way in. We once again call it in to our park ranger station before the four of us make our way in on foot. After no more than five to seven minutes of walking and searching, we could see a small light coming through some bushes in the distance. As we got closer, we were able to see some smoke, which we associated with a campfire and we could also get further confirmation when we reach a campsite. Let's just say it was really creepy. There was a giant pentagram sprayed on the ground, with candles surrounding its circumference. We also saw a bunch of strange looking dolls, knives, and a bunch of beer bottles too. While I tried to get a signal to call it in, we started to hear the sound of tree branches breaking and footsteps approaching from the distance. We now each take a defensive stance, as about 10 robed individuals pop out of nowhere. At least 5 of them were armed with shotguns, and a few others had some knives. My partner instinctively asked who they were, but they ended up remaining silent. 10 to 15 seconds of this awkward stare down, we hear somebody tell the strangers to stand down, before another robed individual reveals themselves. This one was dressed in a red robe, unlike the others who were dressed in all black. He also had a skull mask. We were guessing he must have been the leader of the group. Anyway, he proceeds to inform us that they had been camping out here as part of a members only society of demons. His words, not mine. Basically, he told us that they didn't want to be disturbed, which was why they came all the way out there. Surprisingly, he was very calm and talked in a way as if he had practiced this sort of response. He tells us that they had no clue the area was off limits and said they were willing to comply with the rules as well as clean up after themselves. They even presented the proper documentation for their weaponry. So far it seemed like everything checked out, apart from just being a bunch of weirdos. 
Sorry, at least that's how I viewed it. Anyway, we still wrote up a citation after escorting them back to their vehicles. And fast forward a couple of days later, and I did some more research into the group with the information they provided me with. It turned out that they were part of some weird cult who would go out of their way every month to do their strange rituals using dolls. It's been years since I last saw them, and it's only up to a month ago I tried doing more research, but I haven't been able to find anything. Since I don't remember their cult name, there's not much in proof I can provide for all of you other than my fellow park rangers who are willing to back me up. Like I said before, if any of this sounds familiar or you live in Alaska, then feel free to send me a message. I'd love to hear any more information if you have any. Hey there everyone, I heard you all like scary stories, and I have one for you that happened to my cousin and I about 7 years ago. It's pretty long, so I apologize for the length of this. Now I've had some pretty creepy things happen to me in my life, but most of them are pretty boring in the scary sense. Besides, I'm sure you've all had to deal with some creepy guy staring over at you and calling you names, but that's not what the story is about. So to get you started, this was in 2012 and I was 20 years old. I'm female by the way. It was the end of the semester and I was looking for something fun to do. Well luckily for me, I have an older cousin who is into camping. So when you know it, he brought up the idea of going on a weekend long camping trip in the mountains. So we set out into the Denali National Park and drive about 30 miles from our small town until we arrive at a forest area. It's pretty much in the middle of nowhere where there's no cell phone reception. This means if we needed a call for help, we were pretty much on our own. So my cousin, who we will call Alex, had brought a small knife and I brought some pepper spray with me. Not that we were expecting to use them, but you just never know. Side note, these items would end up saving our lives, but I'll get to that a little bit later. So yeah, we walk into the forest for about 10 minutes and we eventually settle on a spot that's next to a small lake. I then set up my tent and my cousin Alex sets up his. After about 30 minutes of setting up, we take out some of the food we had packed with us and get to cooking hot dogs and hamburgers. At this time, it's around 6.30 p.m., so we still have plenty of sunlight. Now, before heading into the tent, Alex and I decide to walk over to the lake and try to see if we could catch some fish. After all, Alex had been here before and we had brought some fishing rods with us too. This is when the first signs of us not being alone began to make themselves known. So we're sitting with the fishing rods, having some laughs, and drinking some sodas, when Alex happens to catch movement in the distance. Now I should mention by this point it's almost close to 8pm and there's just enough sunlight to catch the glimpse of a shadow moving behind the trees. Alex tells me to be quiet and he points to a figure that appears to disappear behind the tree line just a short distance from the other side of the lake. This is when I say, are you sure you saw movement? Come on, stop trying to scare me. I pay more attention as Alex grabs his flashlight and points it in the direction we had just seen the figure. Alex manages to reveal what looks to be like a large man in a hoodie who of all things has a machete. It did scare us as we're pretty much out here in the middle of nowhere. This is the point where we thought that he was going to run over to my cousin and I and chop us into bit sized pieces. But instead this man walks out from the woods and then proceeds to stare us down for about 15 seconds. Really weird but he seemed innocent, which is why both Alex and I thought nothing of him. Either way, don't forget him because I'm going to mention him just a little bit later. Fast forward about 3 hours and both myself and Alex had already forgotten about this stranger from earlier. We are in our respective tents and I was laying down in mine reading a book. That's when I started to hear footsteps. Of course with Alex there, I assumed it was him getting up to use the restroom. I now go back to focusing on my book, but after a couple of minutes I began to hear whispers. It's just audible enough to hear, but not audible enough to understand it. Again, assuming it's Alex, I ignore the sounds. But then I'm able to hear someone scratching at the side of the tent. I genuinely started to get spooked, so I yelled out, Alex, knock it off already, I'm trying to sleep. The noises go silent, and then it sounds like footsteps slowly walked away. Annoyed, I exit and I walk over to Alex's tent. Okay, Alex, you can come out now, this isn't funny. He doesn't open, so I head in and the dude is fast asleep. 
He's a heavy sleeper, by the way. Well, after yelling and shaking him for a solid 15 seconds, he finally grumbles out of his dreamland. Oh, come on, what do you want? What I want is an explanation. Why were you trying to scare me earlier? Alex had no idea what I was talking about. So then, if it wasn't Alex, who or what was the noise? Alex explains that it was most likely the wind and the nearby tree branches scratching against the tent, which did make sense after all. There was only one problem, however. There were no tree branches close enough to touch my tent. Also, there was no wind. This was when I remembered the guy from earlier. You don't think it was that one guy we saw by the lake, do you? Alex tells me I was being paranoid and says it was most likely a squirrel or some other wild animal. After about 10 minutes, he is able to convince me that what I heard was just innocent. Thus, I go back to the tent and nothing else happens that evening. Fast forward two days later and everything had been going pretty smoothly. We now move on to the final night. Here's when things get downright scary. Alex and I have been out exploring and we're just now coming back to our campsite, tired but excited to cook some of the fish that we had caught. As we approach, we're able to see a figure walking around our campsite. Bear in mind, he was also carrying something on his back, but it was hard to tell due to the lighting. Alex grows angry, so he grabs his knife and starts walking over to the dude. I stayed behind, which turned out to save both of us. Just when Alex reaches the clearing, we both hear the sound of loud gunshots echoing through the woods. The dude had a rifle, and he fired into our tents. It's scary thinking about that today, but I think he thought that we were in there and he was looking to finish the job. Needless to say, Alex freezes in place as the creep had now spotted him. The man then demands he slowly walk over to him while having that barrel pointed directly at his face. It was so scary, I didn't know what to do. If I run out there to try and save him, I would have been a goner. So I needed to come up with something quickly. Thus, with the cover of the trees, I make my way closer, eventually getting within jumping distance. All the while, I'm thinking, he's going to shoot Alex. The man now demands to know why we were on his property, but Alex reminds him that this is a national park, and there's no way that this area was private property. While thinking my cousin is a goner, I make the decision to yell and scream as loudly as I could. This distracts him just enough for my cousin to kick him in the groin, which apparently was so strong because it caused the rifle to go flying out of his hands. Alex reaches for it, and now the tides have turned. Now seeing that the worst was finally over, I step out of the forest, and now I can see him better. Guess who it was? The same guy from nights before. The one we had seen at the lake. Well, what happens next is us telling him to leave, which he wastes zero time in doing so. Fast forward a day later and we went to the police station where we explained our story and turned in the rifle. After an investigation, it turned out that it was actually stolen. On top of that, the area of the forest we were in belonged to no one, just like I said before. So he had lied about it being his private property. Not that it took a genius to realize that. Anyway, that was one of the most scariest and intense stories of my entire life thus far. And I hope that none of you out there have to experience that firsthand, because it's definitely traumatizing. Before I moved to Montana to pursue a job with the police, from 1997 to 2002, I worked as a park ranger under its law enforcement branch for the Grand Canyon National Park. During my years of work, I had to deal with patrolling the vast acreage of million-year-old dirt and crevices which featured some of the most beautiful sunsets and sunrises one can imagine. How I can still remember the birds chirping and the chilling wind tingle your senses as you got lost with the overall beauty. But along with its breathtaking sights and fresh air came the creepy events to be expected with such a job. This is just one of the many scary stories I have to share with you all. If you're interested in hearing more then I would be more than happy to send them into the creepy fox. Just let me know in the comments and I'll start to write them up when I've got some free time. So it all started when myself and another park ranger, who we'll refer to as Javier, had stopped to talk to a family of four who had been camping near the north rim of the Grand Canyon. 
I actually recall them calling us over to invite Javier and I to have some dinner with them. They were cooking hot dogs and hamburgers, my personal favorite. Now, as we normally aren't supposed to stop and share food with families, we initially told them no, but after much insisting, we accepted their offer. To this day, I'm so glad we did, and no, it's not because of the amazing food, but I'll get to why in a moment. Anyway, the father of the group went to tell Javier and I how much he appreciated our work. He explained that he served in the army as a medic and he had thought about joining the park ranger service someday. We talked about that for the next 20 to 30 minutes while enjoying the sounds of crickets chirping and his wife playing guitar with their two daughters. I still remember them doing quite an amazing impersonation of the Beatles, still one of my favorite bands. Before we knew it, it was time to leave. Javier and I start to bid our farewell when all of a sudden we can see someone beginning to make their way over to us. It was somebody in a dark hoodie. You're making too much noise. What's a guy gotta do around here to enjoy nature and be quiet? Telling by the brown paper bag and his speech pattern, he was clearly drunk. Normally, we can't really say much as he's in nature, but then again, he's in a national park where there are families camping about. Also, the last thing we want is him heading into an area where he could fall to his death and, well, you know the rest. This was why we ended up approaching him and asking some questions. He was calm and cooperative, at least at first, until he got angry when I asked him what was inside the brown paper bag, which let's face it, it doesn't take a genius to realize that he's drinking alcohol. Sir, what are you drinking? Can you please hand it over? He gets angry and starts to reach into his jacket, where just seconds later, he's got a knife. Now I did mention we're part of the law enforcement branch of the park rangers, but that didn't mean we were armed. I mean, we did have pepper spray and a taser, if you want to count that as, air quotations here, armed. But since we aren't technically police officers, we aren't allowed to carry. What happens next was super chilling. He manages to stab me in the arm, causing a gash in my uniform and skin. If I could only describe the amount of stinging and pain I felt, then maybe you would begin to understand the pain. Javier manages to taser him before he's able to cause any more damage, and the drunken creep falls to the dirt. Needless to say, we secure him with the help from the father I mentioned earlier, and he is able to administer first aid thanks to his medical skills and the first aid kit they had with them. Javier meanwhile radios for backup, and eventually police arrived and they're able to arrest him and take him in. We later learned that he had been camping just a few hundred feet from the family behind large rocks, which made it nearly impossible for them to see him. I still believe to this day if Javier and I weren't there, this man could have most likely gone after that family and stabbed them all to death. But I don't think that would have been possible because that father was awesome and he was very protective of his family. Hey there everyone. Former park ranger here to share something quite bizarre. I'm not sure if you would classify it as the scariest story in the world, but if you have a certain fear of what I'm about to describe, then perhaps you might get some chills. Here's what I'm talking about. While working for the United States Forest Service in Alaska, I was head honcho for maintenance. I would essentially drive around the areas that I was assigned to with fellow park rangers, and I would clean up any campsites or trash that might have been left behind by campgoers. The good thing is up here in Alaska, people are pretty respectful with the rules of nature, and it was very rare to spend over 20 minutes picking up garbage. How I longed for something different and exciting, but little did I know I would get more than I bargained for this night. While on patrol one evening in the middle of the deep woods, in a part of the wilderness that was rarely patrolled, my vehicle headlights shined upon an RV that looked to have been abandoned for weeks, or better yet, it looked like it was abandoned for months. The reason I was able to tell was due to the fact that leaves and branches were scattered all over the RV's frame. Now, one of the most important details to look out for here in Alaska is abandoned vehicles. The advice we give to fellow Alaskans is that if you see a vehicle, let's say a week ago, and that vehicle is still there, chances are something might have happened to the driver. I honestly can't tell you how many times in my career we got calls of abandoned vehicles only to have to launch a search party where 9 times out of 10, we find their remains. It's very creepy. But out here in the Alaskan wilderness where people think they're experts in the wild, it's a fairly common 
and it's a creepy sight. Anyway, I go ahead and exit my vehicle and do an immediate search of the surrounding forest. After finding no sort of campsite, nor signs of activity, I begin to approach the RV, knocking on the front door and asking if anybody was inside. 30 seconds of silence, I decided to attempt opening the door, which opened with ease. Inside was a mess. Trash and clothes had been scattered around the floor. Dishes had also been left in the sink, with mold forming and there was just this overall musky smell. But that wasn't the scariest thing. I almost jumped out of my shoes when I see a person staring back at me from the back of the end of the RV. Well, I thought it was a person. Instead, it was a mannequin. Remember how I told you if you have a certain fear of something, this story might get to you? Well, I didn't have a fear of inanimate objects before this, and now I do. Anyway, after having the scare of a lifetime, I see a table sitting right next to the mannequin, and I couldn't believe my eyes. I kid you not, a human skull, sitting on top of a book. Next to both was a knife, and on the table was also a hand-drawn pentagram. Immediately, I thought that this had to have been some sort of strange ritual site, which was further proven when I opened the book and I see a bunch of passages about sacrifices and other things I'd rather not mention here so you don't get demonetized. Anyway, I went ahead and called for police as well as other park rangers. Now sorry to burst your bubble, but nobody popped out at me or tried to stab me. Instead, we ended up testing the skull, which turned out to be a fake. But it was a pretty convincing fake, I'll tell you that. As for who might have left the RV there, we never were able to determine that since there was no license plate nor other sort of documentation that might have led us to a possible owner. Also, there is no report of RVs missing in the area. It's a mystery that still remains unsolved in our department to this very day. Two summers ago, I was camping with my Newfoundland at Yosemite National Park in the Sierra Nevada Mountains. It was a nice location and I was about a quarter of a mile from a parking spot where other families had been camping. Of course, I could have chosen to be with all the nearby families, but I preferred being out on my own. So my Newfie and I are sitting around our campfire and it's around 7pm and that's when all of a sudden she starts to growl. Pretty soon, this man steps out of the wilderness and of all things, he's got an axe. Hey there, beautiful. Don't mind me, I'm just out here for an evening walk. Carry on. I wouldn't have minded him if it wasn't for a couple of things. For one, what was up with the axe? And two, why did he speak as if he had just finished hanging out with his friends at the local bar? I wasn't sure, but my dog never broke eye contact with him as he stumbled back into the woods and I no longer heard him. This should have been my first sign to just get up and leave. But for whatever reason, I convinced myself he was just some fellow camper trying to play a prank on the campgoers. Being naive this evening was going to lead to me having to deal with one of the more frightening moments of my entire life. Fast forward to around 11pm, and I'm waking up to my dog letting out a low growling sound. Thinking maybe she had to use the restroom, I crawl over to the zipper. But here's the deal. When I go for the zipper, it starts opening by itself. My dog is now up and alert as we're now face to face with a person responsible. It's dark, but I can just make out enough details to see it's somebody in a hoodie with a mask on. Well, it doesn't take more than a few seconds for my new feet to charge at him and the dude takes off running. Once the coast was clear, I crawl out of the tent, only for my hand to touch an axe. Something was familiar, and then I remembered it. It looked just like the one the man from earlier was carrying. I later determined. Or should I say, assumed that he had been stalking my tent and was trying to get in to do who knows what. How he had completely forgotten about my dog, I don't know. But if it wasn't for her being there with me and waking me up, he could have done so many awful things to me. Anyway, we both run over to the nearby families who still had been awake and I explained the encounter from earlier. They told me that they hadn't seen him and that none of them were walking around in the middle of the woods. They did tell me that I was more than welcome to camp alongside them, to which is what we do. Police were called, but they never found the guy. This is something that happened about a month ago. For some quick information, I live in a small town in Montana that's near a state park. 
For personal reasons, I won't say the name of the town, but I will say this. Nothing really happens here and you rarely hear of anything too serious happening. After what happened, however, I think otherwise. So on this day, I was feeling pretty bored at home. I have two younger sisters, but they were both in school at the time. With my mom and dad not being home either, I thought perhaps I could go to the park. You see, I was in college when this took place and something I did on my days off was take photographs. I figured I could go out there for the day and return before everybody was going to arrive home. Before I left, I did make sure to call my mom and I told her that I was going inside the state park. She didn't answer, so I left her a message on her voicemail. Hey mom, just as a heads up, I'm going to the park today. I should be back around 5pm, so I'll be able to help you out for dinner. I'm also going to bring Kevin with me. I think he'll appreciate the walk. By the way, Kevin is our 5 year old golden retriever and I take him with me anytime I go out. With Kevin in one hand and the keys to my car in the other, I close the door to the house and proceed to my car. Before I ended up reaching the park, I did drive into town to pick up a few supplies from the store. It was here I grabbed some snacks, as well as a couple of water bottles too. Once I had everything I needed, we get back into the car and we make the half hour drive over to the other side of town. For the most part, the park looked pretty quiet today as we entered the parking area. I did see a couple of park rangers who sat at a bench eating some lunch and I went over to give them a friendly hello and they said the same thing back. Now before I left, they did tell me that certain areas were still a little bit muddy from the recent rains, so they just told me to be very careful. With the advice in hand, me and Kevin go down the same familiar trails. Halfway through our walk, I was able to see the mud that they were talking about. Sadly, the trail we normally take was pretty muddy, so we couldn't really go that way. Still, we were out here and we didn't want to waste the afternoon for nothing. After all, I didn't just drive out here for nothing and just to turn around and give up. Instead, I ended up taking us down another trail that was off the normal path. Looking back, I don't think that was a very smart idea. For starters, the area itself gets very lonesome. Few people even go out there, and I myself have never been out there to that part of the park before. Of course, with little knowledge of what was ahead of me, I wasn't sure of what to expect. So as I made my way down these twists and turns, the once familiar path from before was turning into a set of woods. It was while going down this trail for, I want to say, 20 minutes, I started to get some really bad vibes. What made this worse was when I take a look towards Kevin and I hear as he started letting out this low growling. Strange for a golden retriever. So I just figured I was just imagining things and we continued on a little bit more. Up ahead of me, I was able to see a small lake area where you could also see an island in the middle. It was neat, so to calm myself down, I take my camera out from my backpack and started to snap some photos. Kevin was pretty calm right now. So now I knew for sure I was just making a huge deal for nothing. Well okay, fast forward a few more minutes. I sat down with Kevin as we ate some snacks and we took a look back at the pictures. And for whatever reason, I looked up ahead of me for a brief moment. And I was able to notice a tall looking individual who appeared to be wearing a mask. And they also had all dark clothing on. I froze at that sight because I started to think about the noises and feelings from earlier. Who were they? And why were they dressed like that out here in the middle of nowhere? Well instantly I felt this chill in the air and something was telling me that we needed to leave. And I don't think Kevin was going to second guess it because we immediately both start returning back. And as we're making our way down the bend that took us back to the same familiar trail, I happened to once again hear Kevin, only this time he was making a whining sound. Now, from the times Kevin has done that, I know it's because he either saw something or felt that something was off. It was true. In the distance, just beyond the tree line, both of us can now see that there is another person stumbling around, and they look just like the other one, the same mask and all, and dark clothing. Needless to say, as soon as we see the park rangers, I ended up reporting that strange activity. Now don't worry, I promise you it's going to get a lot worse. See, nothing happened to me, but they told me that they would keep a lookout. And about a week later, there was a story in the news about somebody in a mask getting into somebody's campsite and they ended up mugging them at gunpoint. 
The person, along with her accomplice, were eventually apprehended, but that's not what gets to me. What gets to me is he had been seemingly following me through the woods, as well as his partner. Now sometimes I'll find myself reflecting on this incident, and sometimes I do wonder whether or not those two were planning on mugging me, or worse, but since they saw Kevin, they decided not to. Not sure. Anyway, let's just say that Kevin ended up getting a bunch of extra hugs and extra treats. Hey there everyone, I just spent the last few hours remembering this story and I thought I would go ahead and write it down for all of you. I'm currently 19 years old but this happened about a year ago and ever since this happened I've had this really bad feeling of going out into national parks, especially when it's dark. Looking back, it wasn't the smartest idea I had, but I was pretty naive back then. So with that, allow me to paint a proper picture for you. I live in Southern California, where my neighbor lies right next to a state park. It was also late October at the time, so the sunset was normal around 6pm. So one of the reasons I enjoyed going out here was because of the great views you got when you reached the top of the mountain sides. In my time out there, I normally encountered friendly people. Oftentimes, you would run into daytime runners or even people on bicycles enjoying the beautiful outdoors. There were even a few times I saw coyotes and even once a bobcat. But anyway, enough of that background. This was Saturday afternoon and I decided I was going to go for a run. Mistake number one was going at night. Second mistake was telling nobody where I was going to be. Although looking back, my mom and dad knew if they saw my backpack and I wasn't home, then I was out running or walking in the state park. That was where I found myself around 5pm. I started my normal routine of stretching and then I began walking for about half a mile. Once I reached a crossroads in the trail, I decided to go down a different trail. Normally I take this trail in the daytime, but for some reason I told myself to go now. Mistake number 3. I began the walk up this trail while running into a couple of people walking their dog. They were really chill and they reminded me about the sunset, but I already knew that. But in my mind I figured I could just go ahead and reach the top of the mountain and get a sight of the valley below. Finally after another 20 minutes I reached the top of the small mountain area where I arrived just in time for the sunset. It was very beautiful and I even posted the photos if you want to see them. What wasn't beautiful, however, was what I would experience. As I sat there for another 10 minutes, I started to become aware of some sounds. This mountaintop, if you want to call it that, has this field with trees and trail behind me. Really, I'm unable to see if anybody might be coming up the trail unless I walked over there. I believe that's why I hadn't noticed this man that walked up here. You see, while I sat there listening to some music, this man, that I want to say was in his late 40s, walked up to the top of the mountain and just stood there. He had long blonde hair and a ponytail, and he looked as if he hadn't showered in months. Not exactly somebody you would expect out in that park, but hey, whatever. I thought perhaps he was just another sightseer, and I left it at that. More than anything, I did my best not to pay attention to him. As the minutes went by, I was expecting him to leave, but he just kept standing there, menacingly. Also, it's not like he was looking toward the sunset, which it looked like he did first, but he kept looking at me and mumbling to himself. I was starting to get a bit concerned, and so I told myself, it's now time for me to go. And as I get up to leave, this is when he finally spoke up. Now, this isn't word for word, so I'm just going to go ahead and paraphrase what I remember him saying. Hey, you know what they say about being out here in the middle of nowhere? It's not exactly the smartest idea when there might be a stranger following you. Am I right? I nervously laughed and wished him a good evening, and I started walking back the way I'd come. I was just hoping that was the end of that, but it was about to get even worse. I'd say about 20 minutes later, I make it to the bottom of this mountain area and I began the two mile walk back to the entrance. By this point in the afternoon, the sun had just set over the mountains and the light from the valley was starting to slowly disappear. Also, I had put that strange encounter from earlier behind me as I no longer saw any signs of him. 
Looking back to 20 minutes earlier, I just told myself that he was probably just joking around with me and maybe he was a little bit out there, not sure. Anyway, I'm about 10 minutes from the exit and I began to hear footsteps nearby. Now obviously I hadn't seen anyone anymore, but my first thought was perhaps the last few people were exiting the park. The thing is, as soon as I stopped, the footsteps did as well. So I take a look behind me, but the thing is, I don't see anyone. That was strange, I tell myself. Once again, I walk for another 30 seconds or so, and I'm able to hear footsteps yet again. Same process of stopping, and the noises doing the same. One thing was now for certain. Someone or something nearby was following me, and they weren't wanting to be seen. Now, I thought about the recent mountain lion encounter I read about in the paper, so I started to think about that. However, that mountain lion idea would soon be a distant memory for what happens next. I would never forget this. Seemingly out of nowhere, I saw somebody step onto the trail just beyond the trees. It was hard to tell due to it now being dark in the valley, but I could see someone start making their way towards me. I thought it was strange, because it looked just like the man from earlier, only this time something was very different. Now I could see the outline of the shape of a sharp object in their hand. A knife. Now, it doesn't take a genius to realize that I took off running, and as I do so, I can hear him behind me breathing heavily and laughing, but not like a normal person. All the meanwhile, I'm just crying on the inside and I'm thinking the worst. This is where I'm going to end up getting stabbed. Well, thank God, because what happens next I honestly believe was karma. You see, he ends up tripping and falling on the ground, which was now my opportunity and chance, as I'm able to get out of there before he catches up to me. Now, once again, I thought that that was going to be the end of it, but it wasn't, because obviously I did report the incident to park rangers and police officers, but nothing came of it. That was until a few months later. One day while walking outside my house, I took one look towards the entrance of the state park. There standing behind some trees, I saw someone who looked just like the man from my first encounter. Actually, I was certain it was him. That was the last time, however, I ever saw him around my area. And I haven't heard anything else since then. I would like to be happy he wasn't around anymore. But something in me tells me that I should always keep a watchful eye. As an edit, I did try speaking with my dad's friend who worked for the police station at the time, but unfortunately, there were no updates from him or the police station whatsoever. To be quite honest with all of you, I'm not really sure if this is classified as scary or not. Don't get me wrong, I might have never seen my family ever again if I would have made the wrong move, but part of me laughs anytime I share this with family and loved ones. What occurred was two years ago when I was finishing up some administrative paperwork inside our park ranger station. All the other park rangers had already left for the 4th of July holiday, and the only thing keeping me company was the sound of rain hitting the windows and the distant thunder that rolled over the mountains. By the time I was finished, it was nearing 11 p.m., and I was struggling to keep my eyes open. I couldn't wait to get home, where my wife had some food ready for me. So I went ahead and turned all the lights off and then start to close up. And when I go outside, I began to hear shuffling coming from the dumpster. Since we are in the woods, we oftentimes get raccoons who go through the trash. It's not that we don't mind them, it's just that they make a huge mess, and we are the ones that have to clean up after them. That's why I went ahead and make my way over to the back of the building, thinking I would be chasing away these masked little bandits. I was in for quite the surprise. You see, I hadn't startled a family of raccoons. Instead, it was a family of bears. All of a sudden, my body froze as the bears became startled and began to make their way toward me. There was nothing I could do. In case you weren't aware, bears can easily outrun human beings. I would have had no chance to get to my car or unlock the building's doors. I pretty much stood there already accepting the outcome, but to my surprise, the bears just run past me. Well, okay, so you're telling me all those cliche plots in dinosaur movies 
where the hero avoids being eaten by not moving is true? Well, maybe it was because of how dark it was, and the fact I had dark clothing on, it might have been enough of a camouflage to avoid being eaten and mauled to death. That didn't stop me from passing out from the rush of fear. Now, I didn't know how long I'd been out for, but I'd say it must have been at least a good 15 to 20 seconds, since it also took me an additional minute of laying in the mud to realize what had just happened. I had to take a seat and recollect my thoughts before I called up my buddy of mine to come and pick me up. I did make it home about 45 minutes later than what I was originally planning, but I was just happy that I was in bed. But like I said, it's not the scariest story in the world, unless of course you take the context into consideration. Just imagine being out in a forest in the middle of nowhere, only for bears to come running at you. I don't think the bravest of you could honestly say you wouldn't have had some sort of reaction. Also, to the bears who didn't chew me up, thank you. I owe you a bunch of jars of honey. This happened a couple of summers ago when I was volunteering at a park ranger station. You see, I was still in university at the time, and while I was in my final year, I was volunteering in a national park. Of course, being that I was here, you can imagine my ultimate goal was to work for the park ranger service. I am now, and although I've had some pretty interesting experiences thus far, this one from when I was volunteering definitely got to me. So as a volunteer there, I would do pretty basic things. I would help handle paperwork at the station, which was more like a small cabin, and even at times I would go with the park rangers themselves as they drive around checking up on things. I always enjoyed that part because it allowed me an escape from all the endless paperwork and it also gave me the opportunity to see the park with my own eyes. You see, I had been camping here before when I was younger, but there were areas that were off limits. The main reasons being because the areas were lonesome and there were many wild animals spotted out there. These were mainly mountain lions and bears amongst other creatures. Trust me, the last thing you would want to do is be camping out there and then get visited by one of those predators. I'm pretty sure they wouldn't just be there to give you a friendly hug. Anyway, I remember one night in particular. By this point, I want to say it's around 8pm and I was working on some paperwork at the front desk. I sat there minding my own business until one of the park rangers walked up to me and said, Hey, that sure looks like a lot of fun. Must be nice doing that paperwork. Yeah, really funny there, David. Look, I'm trying to get this done. I can't talk right now. David was the recruiter, so to speak, as he looked after the volunteers. In this case, it was just myself, the only volunteer there since the other two were currently at home. He was a jokester to say the least. Okay, well, all kidding aside, why don't you take a break from that paperwork and come join me? I need to go do my usual checkups, so if you want to join me, you're more than welcome to. Of course I wanted to. After all, it was better than just signing a bunch of papers. I agree, and so we start heading over to the vehicle to begin the nightly routine. The route starts off fairly basic. It goes down a few miles of barren dirt roads, and then turns into a set of woods. Finally, you head up a mountain trail until eventually you turn back around and head back to the station. So, anyway, we're driving for about half an hour, and I recall both of us talking about the football game from the other night as we made our way down the first part of our journey. Once we reach the end of this flat dirt road, we take the opportunity to stop by a lake that was at the end of it. It was nice, and since the moonlight and stars reflected off the water's surface, it added to this overall bliss of being out in nature. Sure, it was better than what I was doing. We stood there looking at the lake, I want to say for another five minutes, when suddenly David receives a call on the radio. Weird as it was a Sunday and the park was pretty much empty, but he answers it regardless, thinking it was just John, our boss, checking up on us. Hey there John, what's going on? Did you need something? Yes, I need you to go check out the fairground area that's just beyond the mountain trail. It seems there's some campers up there, and they're saying they're hearing strange sounds just outside their tent. I told them to stay calm and said that we would send somebody out there. Well, great, David said in an annoyed tone. Obviously, since we didn't know what we were dealing with, David was going to take me back to the cabin, but I think even he realized that wasn't really a good idea. 
So we quickly get inside the vehicle and we make the drive over and we're able to see a light up in the distance which we figured was belonging to the campfire. It was and soon enough we're welcomed with the side of a lonely little tent. David then says, Okay, we're here. We received your call. Is everything okay? Out step out a young couple who looked like they had just seen a ghost. It would soon be us seeing something as well, because as they were trying to explain what had just happened, we start hearing noises. That was when one of them told us that was the same sound they had heard just a little bit before, and quickly they run over to our car and jump inside. Me and David were confused to what we were hearing, so we stepped forward a little bit shining our spotlight into the nearby trees. I froze at what I see next. There behind some trees are a set of eyes. And no, before you think it was a person, it wasn't. I was facing a mountain lion. Now to be perfectly honest with you, it kind of felt like if Dio had suddenly come out of nowhere and he had used his stand, the world, as it seemed like time had just stopped. And I was really feeling that at any moment this lion was about to pounce. Anyway, I finally realized what was going on when David yells at me to start moving. As fast as I could, I jump right into the passenger seat with David joining soon after. It's now we're all face to face with two mountain lions, as another one had joined it. And they're growling and scratching and acting very aggressively. Something that normally doesn't happen. That's what we found so bizarre. Sure, there have been stories of people's encounters with mountain lions. But for them to suddenly act that way, we just couldn't really explain it. Looking back, we would like to think that perhaps we had gotten too close to their home and maybe they were looking after their young ones. This is why we tell people not to come out here, but some just don't listen. Either way, we drive out of there with a young couple and we return back to the station. Obviously both of them were pretty shaken up, which was quite understandable but I'm sure they were happy that we showed up when we did. After that night, we did return back to their campsite and got their belongings and that was pretty much it. I myself didn't personally encounter any more mountain lions after that experience, and soon after, I did get hired full time. Like I mentioned at the beginning of my entry, there were a few other instances of encounters with wild animals from people that were there, but none would come as close. As to that night, we almost got mauled by mountain lions. Hey there everyone, it's me, the park ranger from the previous story. Remember how I said I had some other encounters and stories to tell you? Well, I guess I'll go ahead and give you another one. It's funny because looking back on this, it seems that I was the only one to have these sorts of experiences. I laugh about it now but in that moment it was quite the shocking experience. As you know, I was volunteering for the park ranger service for quite a while, until eventually I was finally hired to work full time. Once I was hired to be a park ranger, I moved on from the office work at the station and now I did what normally would be expected. The once boring uneventful days turned into driving around the park and helping out people whenever they needed anything. Of course, that didn't mean there were times I had to handle paperwork sometimes. Anyway, this takes place on a weekend when I had some time off. Now, normally, any person would choose to spend their time doing something else, like maybe going to an amusement park. But for me, I decided I wanted to go camping. How funny considering I work pretty much every single day in the woods. This time, however, I decided to bring my dog Albert with me to keep me company. After all, it gets pretty lonesome when you're pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Also, did I forget to mention I wasn't going to the same park? There was another park I wanted to go and visit that was a few hours away from me. My cousins have actually gone there and they've always told me about how beautiful it was. And they recommended I visit because there's said to be this very beautiful waterfall with a camping area that's right next to it. It sounded like a great plan to me. So one mid-afternoon, I leave my apartment and me and Albert make the 45 minute drive to the park. With me, I brought along some extra food as well as some supplies that I would use for my time out there. Anyway, we arrive and now I proceeded to head over to the park ranger station. And once we arrived, I went ahead and introduced myself to them 
and instantly they welcomed me like I was part of the family. Hello there, it's nice to have another one of our brothers visiting us. I hope you enjoy your time out there. Let us know if you need anything. Yes, I was actually wondering. My cousins have been out here before and they told me about this waterfall with a camping area next to it. Any idea on where I could find it? Of course. Here, take a look at this map. You just follow this trail for about 45 minutes and you should reach it. It's really only about 3 miles away and it's a pretty popular spot. Nice. I thanked them for the help and me and Albert proceeded to head down the trail that he mentioned. Another thing to mention was that it was around 5.30pm and the evening was starting to approach. Still, we had about 2 hours of sunlight left, so it gave me more than enough time to start a little campfire and set up a tent. Eventually, after walking down this trail, I start hearing what sounds like water, and sure enough, up ahead in the opening, I was able to see the waterfall I had heard about from my cousins. It was beautiful. The sounds of the water splashing down into the river, the birds singing and the crickets just beginning to sing their nightly tunes. What better experience could I want? It's now at this point I became aware of a tent up ahead of me that seemed to feature a family that was camping. Now the thing is, I didn't want to camp near them, but when what I'm assuming was the dad saw me, he gives me a friendly hello and waves over to me. He seemed nice, so I walk on over and introduce myself. He tells me himself, his wife and son were spending the night camping out in the woods, and just like that it seems we connected. He was a biology professor and he began telling me about all the things he was teaching. So while his son and Albert were playing, he helped me set up my campsite, all the meanwhile not knowing what was going to happen in just a couple of hours. So after we ate dinner, I excused myself and I made my way over to my tent. And after a few hours passed by, it's now around 11pm. At this point, Albert was asleep next to me, and I was taking the time to read my favorite novel. Seemingly out of nowhere, however, I started to hear what sounds like what I first thought was a bear. I know I wasn't hearing a person because I instantly recognized the sounds. And as it turns out, I was correct. See, I had my lantern on, so I could see the shadows of movement outside my tent. And sure enough, the outline of a bear forms, and that's when I froze. It's now my dog started to growl, and I feared for our safety. This bear could easily maul us to death and tear down the tent. But the thing is, from where I sat, I see as the shadow heads away from my tent, and the footsteps are starting to grow distant. But here's the thing, the footsteps aren't going back into the woods. Actually, it seems they're heading right on over to that other family's tent. That's when I immediately realized, this could be really bad. Surely. By now they're asleep, and if they woke up startled, the bear might react and maul them. Finally, it seems like Albert is starting to growl even more and he's acting even more aggressive. Better late than never, I guess. Anyway, I try to calm him down as I kept thinking about what I should do, even if there was something I could do. Do I step out of the tent and try to get the bear's attention, thus moving him away from that family? Or do I do nothing and hope that he will leave? Either option had me sweating bullets because we were dealing with a wild animal that was very unpredictable. Now just as I was about to act, I hear a yell from the other tent and that's when I realized what was going on. I'm able to see as the bear is looking inside of their tent. I guess they didn't close it properly or something. Now immediately, Albert then goes running after it barking like I'd never seen him do before. With that, the bear turns around and goes off running into the woods. Eventually he returns, but you can just imagine the look of concern on the family's face. As it turns out, the wife was still awake reading her own book, like me. That's when she also heard the movement. Well, one thing led to another and she was soon face to face with our visitor. That was when she screamed and that's when my dog reacted. Now obviously, everyone was pretty shaken up and pretty scared, because that bear could have killed any of us. Immediately, we called the park ranger station and they did send out a couple of guys to come help us out. How ironic, the park ranger having to be saved by park rangers himself. Well, at least it gave me a story to tell my co-workers when I got back to work on Monday. So yes, that was the scary experience. And I like to think that if it weren't for Albert chasing away our friend, then chances are things might have turned out differently. By the way, 
I'm still pretty good friends with that family, and oftentimes, they come and visit me at work. Okay, so a couple of years ago during winter break, I decided to go on a little road trip. Now let me tell you about it. You see, originally I had returned home for the winter break to go and visit my family in San Francisco since I had moved to Southern California to attend college there. That university I was attending was perfect for me because it offered a wonderful business program that I was really interested in. My father actually owned his own clothing business and still does and I was looking to expand his work by learning about the field. Anyway, I'd spent New Year's with my family enjoying the wonderful food as well as the countless hours of talking with relatives that I hadn't seen in many years. About a week before returning back home, I actually came up with a great idea. See, I was planning on visiting Yosemite National Park at another time, but I figured since I was already in Northern California, I could make a quick trip there before returning back to my dorm in Southern California. After all, I still had two weeks of vacation, and chances are I was going to spend the time bored in my dorm room anyway. With a plan set in motion, I leave my parents' house and started my adventure to Yosemite National Park. Hours later, I arrive in a small town named Mariposa, where I ended up staying in a small inn. Fun fact, Mariposa in Spanish means butterfly. Moving forward, after spending the night there, I ended up driving over to the actual national park and I began a daytime adventure to walk into that said park. I was actually planning on just staying out there for the day, but after all the hours I spent taking pictures, I knew I wanted to get pictures of the sunset. So I ended up returning back to my car to pick up a tent that I brought with me. Hours later, it's 8pm and I'm enjoying some s'mores and hot chocolate that I brought. I lose track of time, but I did become aware of movement further up ahead of me in the woods. Confused by it, I ended up calling out, only to have a couple of people walk over to me. Hey there, don't mind us, we're just looking for a place to set up camp. Hey, do you mind if we could set up our campsite next to you? It's always great to camp alongside others. They seemed pretty friendly. Him and who I'm guessing was his girlfriend looked to be a couple of years older than myself. With that, they set their camp about 100 feet from mine, and they were actually pretty nice because they invited me over to their campsite for some dinner. While enjoying some dinner and talking to my new friends, we each became aware of this sudden loud yelling. I don't even know how to begin describing what the yelling sounded like. It was like the mix of an animal and a woman screaming at the same time. It seriously got to each of us, and we even thought that perhaps somebody was in trouble or somebody was being murdered. What added to our questions was also seeing what looked to be like the outline of somebody running off in the distance. You don't think somebody might be in trouble and needs her help, do you? The girl said. Eh, I'm sure it's just a wild animal. Forget about it, the guy says. Things did seem to settle down after that and we each returned to our separate tents. I won't lie, I was on high alert that entire night because I really did become concerned about that noise. I don't think the other guy wanted to admit it, but I think even he could tell that there was something seriously wrong with that scream. Like I said, it didn't sound like a noise you would just hear from a person. I actually tried calling using my cell phone too, but no signal. Either way, I was really tired from the entire day of being up, so I ended up just falling asleep. Sometime later, it's about 3am, and I wake up needing to go and pee, so I step outside and find a place to do my business. As I do, I couldn't help but get the sudden sensation that I was being watched. I don't know, it's really hard to explain it. I'm sure those of you who have ever gone camping or been out in the middle of nowhere know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like suddenly all your senses become focused on just this one little important detail and it really makes you feel like you aren't alone. So a bit on the edge, I start making my way back until I heard a sudden noise behind me. I turn around and all of a sudden I'm face to face with a person in a dark hoodie. Obviously with no source of light I couldn't even tell who they were but it was enough to send me running back to my tent in absolute shock. With the commotion my neighbors ended up stepping out of their tent with an absolute look of shock on their faces as well. Dude what's the deal? Why are you yelling? Can't you see we're trying to sleep? I explained to them what I had seen and instantly he goes silent. 
You're not kidding, are you? Because yesterday, we also saw somebody in a dark hoodie, and they were staring over at us from quite afar. I only realized he was there because my wife pointed him out. Needless to say, it was one of the reasons we had decided to change locations. Now, having someone just staring over at your campsite was one thing. Not knowing what his intentions were was pretty scary. It also didn't help that we had heard the screaming. Like I said, was it possible he had taken someone with him and somebody had been killed out there? I'm not exactly too sure, but we didn't see him nor hear the noises after that again. The next morning, we talked to the park rangers about it and they told us others had reported hearing the same screaming and seeing the strange man in the hoodie. Even so, all they were able to find was a leftover jacket, a cable, tape, and a rundown tent about half a mile from where we were staying. I tried checking to see if there were any reports of anyone missing or any sort of unsolved case after that, but I haven't been able to find anything regarding it. This happened to me and my sister a couple of years ago when we decided to spend a weekend rock climbing. I'll tell you right now, it was an experience like none other, and I'm so glad that everything turned out the way it did. If it's one word of advice I can give to all of you, always make sure to come prepared and expect the unexpected. With that said, we are both 22 years old and are both attending the same university in California. Seeing as spring break was fast approaching, me and my sister kept thinking about what we wanted to do for that following week. Most of our friends were going to go to the beach and party there, but we weren't really into that. We were more of the kind of sisters who enjoyed camping in the great outdoors, or in this case, rock climbing. See, as an elective, we were taking a rock climbing course. Sure, it was worth only one credit, but it gave us an opportunity to do something fun. With that mindset, we decided to head out to Joshua Tree National Park. It's a few hours away from our house in Orange County, but it was definitely going to be worth the trip in the end. For those who are unfamiliar with Joshua Tree, it's one of the most beautiful national parks you'll ever visit. Actually, it's said that over a million people visit every single year. I know, right? I guess there's a lot of people like us who enjoy the nature. Another great part of it was the rock climbing experience was very popular there. There were different areas with a variety of difficulties, so it was going to be perfect for us. With that background out of the way, let's fast forward to when we actually arrived and the series of events that were going to take place. So anyway, we were given a map from some friendly park rangers and we started our little trip. And so we start by walking out into the wilderness. Our first stop was getting to an area called Yosemite Valley. It was a little bit further than what we were expecting to walk, but we have heard it's a pretty awesome spot to climb at. I'd say we were walking for about an hour and we see a couple that was walking out of the valley. They greeted us and they said hello and told us that they had seen some coyotes further up ahead. They just told us to be careful and to avoid a certain area where they like to stay at. They then leave, and me and my sister walk a little bit more. Another 20 minutes go by, and we figured now it's a good time for lunch. I grabbed a couple of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches from my backpack, and I handed one over to my sister. And while we sat there enjoying the view around us, we noticed some clouds forming up ahead. One look at them confirmed that they were rain clouds, and it was definitely turning more into a possibility that it might rain. That should have been our first sign to tell ourselves. You know what, now might be a great time to head back home before the rain catches you. That, of course, was the last thing on our minds. After all, I didn't want the drive to have been out there for nothing. So we figured if it did rain, then we can just set up a tent and wait it out. So after our quick lunch, we ended up walking another 30 minutes or so, and we reached Yosemite Valley, just like I had mentioned. At this point in the park, cell phone reception was spotty at best. Sometimes I would get one bar and other times it would say I had no service. This, by the way, plays an important role. Once we reach this rock climbing area, first thing was first. Let us make a quick little campsite and then we can climb. We now spend the next half hour setting up the tent and even getting a little campfire going. Luckily for us, we had supplies already prepared so it didn't really take us too long. By this point in the afternoon, it was around 4pm and our goal was to climb to the top of this area. 
and watch the sunset. With said sunset approaching, me and my sister grab our gear and we begin to climb up. And as we're climbing, I almost lost my grip, but thankfully I was able to catch myself. One of us wouldn't be so lucky though a little bit later. You see, finally we reached the top of the small mountain area and we sat there for about an hour, just enjoying the sunset and the view of the valley below us. As we're doing so, we're starting to notice the clouds are starting to cover the sky above us and were soon welcomed with a light rain. That was a bummer. There went our spot. Now since there was no place to hide from the rain up here, we decided to quickly make our way down before the rain gets too heavy. Not exactly the best idea, I tell you. Here's the thing with the rain. When there is water on a rocky surface, it becomes very slippery. This was something we didn't think about as we made our way down. Now see where this scary thing is heading to? I'm almost certain you can guess what's about to happen. Anyway, thankfully we weren't far from the ground, but with one miscalculation, my sister lost her grip, and well, one thing led to another, and ouch. Now, thank God that my sister didn't end up breaking anything, but unfortunately she did suffer a sprain in her leg, and this would prove to be bad because it's raining out here, and my sister has this sprain. So quickly I help her up and we make our way over to the nearby tent and once in there I get the first aid kit and do what I can to help her out. Obviously in this situation there wasn't really much we could do so my next idea was to call for help. Now remember how I said the phone signal was kinda acting weird? Let's just say it wasn't cooperating whatsoever. I kept trying but each time I would call it just wouldn't go through. So obviously the only thing to do was to wait out the rain and then see if I can get a signal. I do remember about half a mile away from us we had a signal, so I figured that's where I was going to need to go. Now I'll tell you, my sister was the bravest person I ever knew, and still know today, and she handled that sprain like a champion. She told me she would wait, but I of course wanted to go out, but then again it was now raining quite a bit. Finally, after about 20 minutes of rain, things finally seemed to have settled down and it got quiet. I figured now was the perfect opportunity to head out. With that, I get out of the tent and I started to make the walk over. The good thing, I didn't have to go too far because my call finally went through. Thank you, phone. Better late than never. One thing leads to another and I give them our location and they told us they could be out there in about 30 minutes and they just said they'll wait it out. I mean, there wasn't really much else we could do. With that, I returned back to my sister with the good news. Which, speaking of, for the next 30 to 40 minutes, I'm doing my best to tell my sister stories and trying to give her a good laugh as she was clearly still in pain. The distinct sound of coyotes were actually heard, as if things couldn't get any worse. But the good thing was they didn't seem to be too close. And a few minutes after that, we do hear somebody calling out to us. It turned out to be the friendly two from earlier in the day, and together they help us get our things into their car. In the end, when all was said and done, my sister got a cool cast, which of course, I drew on, and she even got a bunch of ice cream that day too. How lucky. So anyway, that was the time my sister and I went rock climbing in the middle of nowhere, had this scary experience where we could have potentially been stranded out there for days, and who knows if we would have survived. Around 2002, I was working as a writer for a local newspaper. My job was pretty simple enough. I mainly wrote articles and events that took place in my small town or I would give people weekly segments about places to visit. I remember one time in particular, my boss told me to write an article about visiting national parks, but that wasn't what really excited me though. What had me jumping for joy was the opportunity he was going to give me he was going to give me an all paid trip to a nice hotel so that I could go take some photographs at a national park. Finally, my dream was about to come true. I actually wanted to go anyway and now I was going to get paid to do so. What could possibly go wrong? Well, you see, something did happen and it remains unexplained to this day and I wanted to see if maybe somebody out there listening might have a possible explanation. Anyway, once I arrived in my hotel, I spent a couple of days getting my laptop and supplies ready to go. 
Once done, I spend the day out in the park taking pictures and checking out the sights. At around 4pm, it was now starting to get dark and it was now time to leave the area. With me, I had quite the camera full of pictures ready to send to my boss and write about in articles. I just couldn't wait to write about the animals I saw and even the nice people I encountered too. Speaking of people, going down the trail suddenly made me feel ill to say the least. I don't know, but it's like somebody was keeping a watchful eye from the distance. I just couldn't really figure out from where. I looked everywhere around me, but I hadn't seen anyone. I even called out and I remember saying, Hello? Who's out there? And nothing. Not a single response back. Okay, so maybe my nerves were getting to me and I was just imagining everything. Still, that couldn't explain away the sudden whispers coming from the woods. Yes, I kid you not. I started hearing what sounded like people having a full-on conversation. Note that I couldn't exactly tell what they were saying, but I knew it was voices. Those moments, I did happen to turn around, and I do see a shadow move behind one of the rock formations. I froze when I see this, because now the idea that I was being stalked out here and that I wasn't alone was starting to come up in my mind. Surely, any normal person would come say hello and let you know of their presence, right? Well, I didn't know what to think, but I wasn't staying around to find out. I do make it out of the woods and I reach the park area where now I finally run into some people that are walking about. One of the security guards actually noticed me and walked over to me wanting to know if everything was okay. Of course, I didn't think he would believe me, so I wasn't going to tell him about it. But I did so anyway, finally convincing myself, why not? The expression on his face definitely made it seem like he was familiar with this story of mine. Here's the thing about these woods. A lot of people say that they'll see shadows or even hear voices sometimes. Unfortunately, there have been some deaths in the area, so it's not uncommon to hear voices or see shadows, and we do recommend people to go out in groups and not by themselves. Well, thanks for letting me know until after. Seriously, that wasn't what really got to me. Knowing about the history that I had no idea about all these years, that gave me the chills. Speaking on chills, one of the pictures I took was pretty frightening. As I look back at the series of pictures I took, I was able to see this blue mist forming on the bottom of two of the photographs. Of course, it was possible it could have just been the lighting, but I had them examined and I found out that that wasn't the case. So yeah, those were some strange memories from that park. If you would like to see some of the pictures and the videotapes I have, I know they're somewhere in my attic and I guess I'll upload them to YouTube sometime. Or I guess better yet, I can send them over to the Creepy Fox and he can feature them as an update to this video. I'll look at the comments section and I'll see what everyone says. And this is the very first time I'm telling this series of encounters to such a vast audience that I'm not exactly sure how to start this off. I guess I should start off by saying that my wife and I have no idea what we saw nor heard. Realize that I'm not looking for fame and I would gain nothing from lying about this. I really just want to tell this tale because I truly believe it's worth sharing. For some background context, my wife and I love to go on road trips every summer. Each year, we would always make plans to visit somewhere new. Being from a small town in Pennsylvania, with a population of roughly 2,000, you do get pretty bored. This year was no different. So when we left our home in late June, we were looking for yet another new place to explore. Some ideas we had were going to Disney World, the Grand Canyon, Universal Studios in Hollywood, etc. As exciting as each of those places were, we had ultimately decided we wanted to spend our time in the great outdoors. Therefore, we set out to go and visit Glacier National Park in Montana. With its over 1 million acres of land and thousands of different animal and plant species, it was no wonder why we had chosen a national park as our ultimate destination. Alongside us, we had brought our 5-year-old German Shepherd named Henry, who would keep us company through our week-long trip. So, after a couple of days of driving, we arrive at a lodging center where first thing we do is plan out exactly how we would begin to navigate this open space. Ultimately, we had the help of some park rangers, who showed us some of the most popular locations and sites to see. 
The park ranger told us there is a beautiful waterfall at the top of a mountainside that gives you the most amazing view you'll ever see. It sounded like a plan, so we figured we would go now so we can get there in time before sunset. While making her way up this series of trails, my wife began taking photos with her DSLR camera. She really loves nocturnal animals, so one thing she was looking for were the owls. We do hear a couple of them and do manage to take a couple of pictures of them. I should mention now, but don't forget about the pictures she takes, because they will reveal something towards the end of this story that really sent chills down her spine. Anyway, as you might imagine, it being around 9pm, it was not only dark out there, but quiet. We did have powerful spotlights with us, so it wasn't really such a worry, and with Henry on our side, we felt confident in our nighttime walk. Something to note is that we only saw people at the lodging area and did see a couple of campfires close by the lodge, but nothing out here. We were at least five miles out in the wilderness by this point, and it was still. Eventually, we continue to follow this dirt path until we can hear the sound of water, and as we get closer to the source of the noise, we were able to see a waterfall and a river. That wasn't the only noise we heard, however. As we stood there listening to the sound of the water and admiring its beauty, we suddenly heard the most disturbing noise we had ever heard in our life. It sounded like somebody was in pain, but it was like there was a filter to it. I'll admit, it was enough to have my wife and I do a double take and even cause Henry to begin to growl. Remember, apart from our lights and the moonlight above us, we were unable to see if something or someone might be out there. Either way, things finally seemed to calm down as the noise suddenly disappeared, just like that. Thinking it was just a wild animal, my wife and I forget about it, and soon we begin heading up this small mountainside. Eventually, we reach an opening where finally after hours of walking, we set up our campsite and start a little campfire. At this point, it's about 10.30pm and we're just wrapping up our evening. Henry laid fast asleep next to me and my wife and I looked up at the stars and recounted stories. At around 11pm we call it a night and now we head inside the tent. Fast forward to around 4pm, I suddenly woke up to no longer being able to sleep. I'm not sure if it was my nerves from earlier that kept me awake or what it was, but I figured to get my mind off of everything I would walk around for a little bit. I figured since Henry was with my wife and I wasn't really going too far, he could keep an eye on her for a while. So I start off by continuing ascending this trail and heading further up into the mountain. From where we camped you were actually able to see another ledge that appeared to offer an even better view from where we were. What better way to surprise my wife than by taking the camera with me and taking pictures of that view. Now I would like to add that as soon as I started heading further up this trail, I couldn't help but once again get the feeling I was being watched. When I was about halfway up the incline, I take a look toward the ledge, and I'm now able to see something standing there. I'm still a fair distance away, mind you, but I could see the outline of something tall, standing on two feet. I initially thought it was a bear, so I started to slowly step back as to not startle it. The only thing is, I don't know of any bear that stands on two feet for longer than five minutes. Whoever, or better yet, Whatever was there had been standing still without moving a single inch. And all of a sudden, they let out an extremely loud yell, and then they run off into the woods. That was enough for me, and immediately I head back to the campsite with an obvious worry over my wife and my dog. Understandably, they're confused just as much as me when I wake them up and tell them about what I had seen. My wife thought that I was joking but even I think she was trying to hide the fact that she wasn't wanting to believe me. In summary, we ended up packing up our things and going back down to the lodging area. We didn't even bother telling the park rangers because I had a feeling they wouldn't believe me. Trust me, a lot of people wouldn't believe me if it weren't for the pictures. Remember the ones I told you about earlier? Well, finally, back at home, we were going through the pictures we had taken, and we do notice a couple of strange things. Obviously, we look through the pictures of the actual road trip, but when we arrive to the pictures from that night, we are shocked at what we see. In one of the photographs, you can see one of the owls my wife got, but when you took a closer look at the bottom right corner, 
but you could see what looked to be like eyes staring back at us through the trees. Since my wife had the light on the camera, it appeared the light was reflecting off their eyes, thus giving the illusion of them glowing. Our idea was perhaps it was a wolf, or maybe a bear, but it didn't explain what I saw that night later on. I still have the pictures if any of you want to see them. Just let me know and I can post it on my Instagram some other time. Thanks for listening. This was in 2016. To take you back, I was running on a trail that takes you into a state park that's right behind my neighborhood. Normally I run for about 2 miles, but this afternoon I decided to go longer than usual. This was because I would be going on a vacation the following day, so I figured I would make up for the time by running extra. Now, the trail I took had a lot of activity within the first 2-3 to three miles, but around mile 4 it gets pretty lonesome. Normally, any time I run in this area, I like to go with a friend of mine, but considering I hadn't seen anyone, I wasn't too worried. Well, there comes a point where you have to go underneath a bridge in order to reach the end of the trail, so I go underneath it and apart from the typical graffiti and trash, nothing really seems out of the ordinary. It's when returning, however, that things change. I'm halfway through the bridge when a man in a ski mask and hoodie walks out from the corner of the exit. It was now blocking my way and I stood there frozen thinking to myself, Great, I'm out here in the deep woods and he's going to come after me, isn't he? I started to back up only to hear laughter behind me. Another man with the same matching attire. I remember thinking to myself, these are most likely teenagers playing some sort of stupid prank, but that mindset changes when one of them takes out a knife. They demand I hand over any valuables I had on me, which consisted of my phone and my iPod. I had no choice, it was two against one. They now start to approach me as I fear they might be after more than my valuables. Just as one of them is about to take my items, I do see someone approaching the tunnel. It appears like a man running with two German Shepherds. This was now my chance. I screamed for help as loudly as I could, and the man and the two German Shepherds run over to my rescue. These guys in the masks basically took off running, never for me to see them again. By the way, the man who had saved me turned out to be a local police officer who happened to be running with his dogs that afternoon. Really, I don't know what the chances of that happening were, but I was very thankful for him regardless. Had he not shown up when he did, things could have turned out so much worse. A few years ago, I decided to visit my family who live up north so I could go backpacking with them in the national park. Luckily, they don't live too far away from it and I thought what a neat way to relive the past after being away from home for almost 10 years. So instead of going by myself, I did end up bringing my German Shepherd Shadow. So on the third day of arriving at my parents' place, Shadow and I take a trail that leads up into the mountains. While walking, we saw a few people that were either runners or fellow backpackers. And after about 30 minutes of walking, I go ahead and set up a small camp. It consisted of just a tent and a campfire, which was really perfect for us. Once we were settled in, I fired up a couple of hot dogs and s'mores and prepared Shadow's meal. All was well, and this night in the woods was turning out to be the greatest decision of my life. That would change a few hours later, however. But before we get to that scary moment, something caught the attention of both myself and Shadow as we ate. It sounded like tree branches being snapped. This caused Shadow to growl. It did surprise me, but after not seeing anything for over a minute, I assumed we probably just heard a squirrel. I give him a treat, and this ends up putting him at ease. So fast forward to around 3 in the morning and I'm waking up to use the restroom. As I begin to exit the tent, I do notice that Shadow was wide awake, but I pet him and reassure him that I was going to be right back. This is where I truly believe I made a decision that would save me. I decided to leave the tent unzipped. I was going to zip it up, but I thought otherwise. So I walk over to a nearby tree and do my thing, and after about 20 seconds, I'm done and I'm about to leave. But then it happens. Out of nowhere, I begin to hear footsteps approaching me as the branches are being disturbed. Why I chose not to back up, I am uncertain of. But regardless, a man in a ski mask, and he has a hunting knife. I froze at that sight. Why would there be a man out there in the middle of nowhere wearing a ski mask? As I pondered these thoughts, he began to maniacally approach me. 
I instinctively start to back up now and think, I should call for Shadow, which is what I do. But before Shadow can arrive, this guy does manage to grab my arm. He then pulls me closer and says one of the creepiest things I've ever heard. I'm going to take that tongue out of you so you can't call for help. Now I should mention, I'm a pretty tough girl. I'm 120 pounds, 5 foot 5, but this guy was easily over 6 foot and weighed, I'd say, 250 pounds. I stood no chance and I feared any sudden movement would cause him to swipe away at me. Anyway, Shadow comes out of seemingly nowhere and like a superhero, instinctively pounces on this guy and goes for his arm. He drops the hunting knife, which I now grab. Shadow, on the other hand, was really ripping into this guy as he tries to wrestle with Shadow. Finally, after what seemed like an eternity, Shadow lets go and this guy takes off. Soon thereafter, I get on my phone and I call a nearby park ranger station and they met up with me 15 minutes later after I walked over to my car. After about an hour of searching, the park rangers come up empty handed and that was it. I never heard back and as far as I know, the man is still at large. Now in case you're wondering, no, I don't know what he was doing out there to begin with and I also don't know why he had a ski mask, but either way, I'm just happy I don't ever have to see him again. Hey there everyone, how are you all doing? I have a story to share with you all today that remains a mystery to me. Any and all ideas would be greatly appreciated. I live in Alaska and still do and this happened about 10 years ago. I was camping in the Denali National Park and I already spent a couple of days camping out there. With me, I had my Siberian Husky, who in this recollection we will call Teddy. Anyway, the days out there were very pleasant and I recall all the wonderful sights we saw as we explored further and further into the wilderness. This ended up happening on the night before I was set to leave. It was, I want to say, 11pm and I was in my tent reading a book. Teddy was next to me already asleep and I also had a small radio that had some soft music playing. Seemingly out of nowhere, it got all staticky, and I could hear this low, constant humming sound, which sounded like it was playing over the music. It was weird, but after I'd been doing this for about a minute or so, I turned it off thinking perhaps the batteries were malfunctioning. I took this as a sign that now it was a good idea to get some sleep, so I put my book away and tried to get some. About two hours later, at around 1am, I awoke to a very bright light. Note that this tent was specifically made to stop light from coming into it, so for there to be light was really confusing to me. As I started to get up, confused, first thing I noticed was Teddy was missing. Teddy is pretty protective, and, well, he's a Siberian Husky, so he's pretty silly sometimes, and he never really leaves my side unless, of course, he needed to go potty. I disregard the light, and I wait for about 2-3 to three minutes, expecting Teddy to return to me. The minutes go on and on, and still there's no Teddy. This was when I started to become a bit worried, so I finally step out of the tent and I see what's going on. No signs of Teddy, but what I am able to see was a series of lights about I'd say a quarter of a mile away from where I was located. It was hard to tell due to all the cover of the trees, and intrigued by it I thought perhaps Teddy had seen the lights and started to follow it. As I get closer, however, I start realizing something. The lights were changing colors. A couple of seconds, they were red. A couple of other seconds, they were blue. Well, wait a minute, red and blue. Are they maybe police officers? That's what I was trying to tell myself. But I didn't hear any people talking like I would normally have expected. Suddenly, I could hear barking behind me, and I saw that Teddy was finally meeting up with me. The thing is, he looked really distressed. It's almost like since the last time I saw him, something had happened to him and now he looked really nervous. This was starting to worry me so I check up on him to make sure he wasn't hurt. Everything appeared to be normal, but that's until I pet his leg. It appeared to be swollen and by the looks of it, it looked like it was actually hurting him. I guess that would explain the way he walked over to me as he limped over. Since he was hurt, my main priority was taking care of Teddy so I help him back up to our campsite. Now back at the campsite, I help him inside the tent and I give him some treats so it can help him get his mind off of the pain. It looked like he had just sprained it or something. 
What was serious though were the series of events that happened all within the next 30 minutes. Forgetting about the strange light I'd seen a bit earlier, I once again tried to get some sleep. It's only that again, the mysterious light started to brighten up my tent, and once again I step outside. What I see surprises me. Through the trees, I could see the faint outline of something taking off and then flying into the distance. Remember, I was quite far from the original side to the light, so I couldn't tell if perhaps it might have been a helicopter. I was confused because there wasn't really any sort of sound. It was like a low frequency kind of hum. That wasn't what really remained a mystery to me. About 15 minutes later, I started to hear a familiar sound. Helicopters. Annoyed by this constant interruption, I step outside only to see a series of darkened helicopters, which flew off the same way which I had seen the strange lights from earlier. Okay, well, maybe one of the bases was doing a test. I don't know. Soon after that, I'm able to see and hear a car approaching. Honestly, at this rate, we might as well have just stood awake. Regardless, we soon meet up with some park rangers, and they told us that we had to leave the area. When wanting to know more about it, all they told me was that they were told not to say anything. I was really intrigued by it, but try as I did, they wouldn't say anything. Not that it would really matter, since I'm pretty sure that they were told the minimum from someone, maybe the police. That was pretty much the end of that. I never got answers, and I never found any more news articles surrounding this. To this day, that night remains unsolved. In 2009, my brother and I decided to take a trip to Las Vegas to go and celebrate his birthday. Our plan was to stay there for 5 days in total, checking out the sights as well as celebrating my brother's special day. He was turning 21 years old. The celebrations were fun and all, but after spending 3 days there we got bored pretty quickly. This was when we came up with the plan of going to the Grand Canyon. Sure, it was a detour we would have to take. Considering we lived in Southern California, but since we were still on winter break, we would find no problem spending time out there. Little did we know the adventure that was going to await us. So anyway, we end up leaving on Saturday evening and we make the drive over to Arizona. Now, let me tell you, the air out there was so clean, it honestly felt like you were in a completely different world. We checked into our motel for that evening and we go to sleep excited for our adventure the next day. The plan was to go and check out a place called Eagle Point. If you've ever been to the Grand Canyon, then you know it's a pretty popular destination. Next morning after breakfast, we get into our RV and we make a 30 minute drive until we see an RV parking area. Once there, we get some of our camping supplies in our backpack and we begin preparing what we would bring with us. Extra food, plenty of water, blankets, you get the idea. Now, before making our way down into the canyon, we ended up checking some details at a nearby park ranger station. We talked to a couple of the park rangers on duty and they reminded us of the areas to avoid as well as giving us the general rundown of the park. Me being the worrisome one, I ended up writing down the phone number for their station just in case we were going to need help. Important detail by the way. With that, we started to make our way down into the valley. And wow, what a sight to see, I'll tell you. I can remember how much everything changed as we started to make our way down there. The rivers and valleys below were now starting to come into better view, and you could actually now see the ground. Of course, getting down there wasn't exactly the easiest thing for me to do. I guess I did forget to mention that myself and heights don't exactly work together, so you can imagine I was pretty much glued to my brother the entire time. Still, I decided to man up and deal with it until we reached the bottom. When we reached the bottom of the valley, we actually saw a couple of the campers who had their little campsites set up. They called over to us and we actually ended up talking with them for a while. One thing they did tell us was to be on the lookout for the mysterious stranger. We were of course unsure of what they were speaking of, but they told us that some campers had their things stolen about a month ago. From the looks of it, the husband and wife weren't exactly unprepared. 
We could see that the husband was packing some serious heat, so we knew they had to be serious about that warning. Either way, we thank them for the information and we continue on with our so-called adventure. Weird, don't you think? I mean, do you really think they were telling the truth about there being some mysterious person out here? I said to my brother. I don't know, but did you see what they were packing? Yeah, you could stop an elephant in one shot with that thing. Glad to know they're on our side, my brother replied. Anyway, we soon put the encounter with those two behind us as we continued on a longer way. I don't remember at what point it was, but I do remember it was right around sunset. By this point, we had found ourselves a place to set up camp and we were just there relaxing. And this is when suddenly we started to hear noises approaching us from the distance. Soon, we were face to face with a man. Confused by his sudden appearance, we watched as he walked over to us, and then we said, Hello, was there something we could do for you, sir? At first, he doesn't really say much, but then he finally spoke up and he says, Oh, don't mind me, I'm actually a native of these parts. I was checking up to see what the two of you were up to. I'm not sure, but the way he spoke had my brother and I a bit on the edge. Sure, he seemed friendly. But at the same time, encountering somewhere out here, in the middle of nowhere, it was a little bit unsettling. It's like somewhere in the tone of his voice, you could tell he knew something was up with this area. Regardless, he soon gets up and just leaves without saying another word. Talk about weird. At this point, my brother and I are almost considering leaving, but it being dark, we didn't want to walk out there, knowing that somebody might be out there waiting for us. Still. I think the nerves got to us because about 20 minutes later, we decided to pack up our things and make the walk out. And man, what an experience that was. Walking around in that canyon at night was like having a blindfold on your face so to speak. Sure, we had our little lights and all, but that wasn't exactly helping, especially when every shadow appeared to be moving the closer they got to you. But I digress. Moving on, we are continuing our two hour journey until eventually we ended up realizing something. The trail we were supposed to take to get up wasn't in front of us. See, us being the naive 20 something year olds, we had decided not to bring a map of any kind. We were pretty much just relying on our memory and with it being dark out there, that memory was pretty much useless. We were looking for a series of rock formations that we ended up calling the Big Wedding Cake because it looked like one of those cakes you would see at a wedding. Yeah, weird analogy I know, but that's what we came up with. Also, next to it was a little pond with a couple of trees that formed a Y. Yeah, we were now officially lost. Now, surely it couldn't get any worse, could it? Please don't get me started. This was when we finally had the great idea of getting on the phone and trying to call for park rangers. Yup, you guessed it. No service whatsoever. Well, now we had no choice but to once again set up camp and wait until the morning. Mind you, it's now about 2am and the nerves that kept us up for hours before were finally starting to peter out. So we set up the camp like I mentioned and we ended up falling asleep after hours of uncertainty. Now during the night I did become aware of what sounded like footsteps, but I ignored it thinking I was just imagining things. Fast forward to about 5 hours later, it's now I'd say 7.30am and we're waking up to what sounds like yelling and arguing off in the distance. Confused by it, we ended up waking up to see what all the commotion was about. We exit the tent, but at first we don't see anyone. We do, however, see what look to be like tracks of what appear to be a large cat around our tent. Obviously, those weren't there when we got there. Well, guess what we happen to see further up ahead of us? Remember that rock formation I mentioned a little bit earlier? Yeah, it had been there the entire time, but I guess with it being so dark, we couldn't really see it so well. Also, I should mention that that's where we saw that couple from the day before. Anyway, we started making our way over there when we suddenly hear this really loud gunshot that echoed throughout the canyon. 
I'll admit, that was enough to get us to run for cover behind some rocks. Once everything had settled down, we're soon welcomed with the sight of the couple from the other night before, as they begin walking over to where we were hiding. We called out to them, and they soon told us what had happened. Here's more or less how the conversation went. Hey, you two kids okay? I hope they didn't get to you. Didn't what get to us? What do you mean? The mountain lions. They didn't head this way, did they? No, sir, we didn't see any mountain lions. Why, what happened? Well, my wife and I were fast asleep in our tent when we suddenly started to hear the sounds of footsteps outside our tent. I woke up and looked out the tent to be face to face with two adult mountain lions. They ended up grabbing my backpack and taking our food with them. And that's when you heard the gunshots I set off as warnings. So that explained why they had done that. So anyway, relieved that we'd finally found our way, they ended up joining us on our way back up. And that was pretty much it. Honestly, it was such a crazy experience, but what really got to us were a couple of things. For starters, who was that man we had seen on that night? And also, how close did we get to being mauled by mountain lions? Surely those questions remained unsolved, and it's something we still think about all these years later.